Assalamu alaikum. Hello? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah? Can everyone hear me? Yes. Sorry. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, thank you all so much for coming out uh, today on a Friday evening. And thank you to the MCC and to Munir especially for uh, helping us to organize this uh, special evening with you. Tonight. Um, my name is Meira Nagaz, and I have the very distinct pleasure of serving as the Executive Director of the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding, or ISPU for short. We are a nonprofit, nonpartisan, independent research organization. And what we do is we conduct and we share research on critical issues facing American Muslims in this country. Our research generates data, much of which you'll see here tonight. We uncover successful solutions to some of our major community challenges, and we amplify the voices of American Muslims through polling. We share this research through forums like these, by gathering people together. We share our research through virtual means, through videos and other things, one of which you'll see here tonight. We share our research through writing op-eds with community leaders and with leaders at the highest levels of government. And all of this we do with the aim of injecting scholarly understanding and facts into the debates and challenges of our time. We're all here tonight, I think, um, because we care. Uh, we, we care about this election cycle and we understand um, how critical it is for our voices to be heard. The topic we're going to be talking about, obviously, is American Muslims and Elections uh, 2016. And I don't think I need to explain to anyone in this room why this is an important and timely topic. We've all seen how polarized this current election cycle has become. We've all seen and experienced the ramped up anti-Muslim rhetoric that's become sadly a staple of this election cycle. And we've started to see the dangerous repercussions of this rhetoric on everyday people, men, women, and children. And I think we're all asking ourselves, what can we do? We're all asking ourselves, how can we deal with this situation? So tonight we're going to do a couple of things. ISPU and our Director of Research will share our groundbreaking survey of American Muslims and other faith groups across America. This survey provides an evidence-based portrait of the American Muslim community and very important data points for educating both ourselves and others. Then we're going to hear from the Council on American Islamic Relations, um, who's going to talk about uh, civic engagement and how to respond to the current elect electoral climate. And then we'll hear from ING, who will talk about the role of education as a response to all that is going on, as well as some steps to address bullying in schools. So without further ado, I want to introduce you to our three uh, panelists tonight. The first panelist we'll hear from is Dahlia Mogahed. She's ISPU's Director of Research, where she leads all of our organization's uh, pioneering research and thought leadership programs on American Muslims. She's the former Executive Director of the Gallup Center for Muslim Studies, where she led the analysis of surveys of communities worldwide, of Muslim communities worldwide. She's the co-author of the book, Who Speaks for Islam? What a Billion Muslims Really Think. And back in 2009, she was appointed to the President's Advisory Council on Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. Many of you probably have seen her TED Talk and her appearances on The Daily Show and other um, news outlets. So I'm going to let Dahlia go first, and I'll introduce the other panelists as they come up. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. I promise you this is not boring, but I want to start before I jump into our uh, poll of American Muslims with how we came to this data. So as Mira said, this election cycle has been plagued with discussion about American Muslims. American Muslims are actually at the heart of this election cycle. The most talked about issue, and we're 1% of the population. But what's missing, oftentimes, even though we are the most discussed topic, the most discussed group, 
is we very rarely hear directly from American Muslims. We are, we are the topic of discussion, but rarely participants in that discussion. So we wanted to address this gaping um, need and wanted to, to contribute to, this, uh, to our democracy by, by giving the, the public a direct access to what American Muslims really think. Now to do that, um, if, if you're familiar with survey research, you would know that polling a, a, a group that is only 1% of the population is extremely difficult. It's extremely difficult to get a representative sample. So we set out to find the country's top methodologist on polling minority groups, especially minority groups that don't show up in the census, right? Because unlike ethnic groups, um, you know, religion is not in the census. So we found David Dutwin. Dr. David Dutwin is the country's leading methodologist on how to poll Jewish Americans. And we asked him to be the, uh, the chief methodologist on this study, how to poll American Muslims. Very similar um, challenges, both groups, about 1% to 2% of the population, and you, you can't um, find them by using our census data. Uh, so we started out there, and we came. We, we gathered a sample, representative national sample of American Muslims, uh, of 550 uh, participants. We didn't just want to poll American Muslims. We also wanted to poll other faith communities in America to give our data context, to, to not just study American Muslims as a um, an isolated specimen, but to actually place them within their country's religious context. So we also polled American Jews, American Catholics, and American Protestants. Our field date, so you're going to ask, when did you ask these questions? I'm going to tell you right off. January 18th to the 30th earlier this year. So this is from January of this year. If you're interested in more about the methodology, you can read all about it on our website. So the first thing to, to note about American Muslims is how diverse we are. It, in fact, American Muslims are the only faith community in America with no majority race. We are about equal portions, um, white or self-identified self as white, Arab, Asian, and African American. Another thing to notice about this, in addition to the fact that we are the only faith community with no majority race, is that uh, the percentage of us that, that identify as Latino or Hispanic has grown, has actually doubled in the last 10 years, and it is the fastest growing community in, 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 our, uh, in our American OMA. Really interesting thing about this graph is this is a lot, this is really what America's gonna look like in 2050 or earlier. American Muslims are dealing with the challenges and opportunities of diversity that the entire country will actually be dealing with in a few decades. And that's an, that's an exciting opportunity to contribute solutions to um, a national uh, challenge that the country will be, will be looking at in, in uh, a few decades. American Muslims are also the youngest, by far the youngest faith community in the United States. Um, and that's one reason of many that the, the projection is that Muslims will be the second largest religious community by the year 2050. Now, where do American Muslims land on the political spectrum? Um, who, who are they voting for in this election season? The top candidate among American Muslims, this is again a, a um, this is a representative sample of all American Muslims, was actually Hillary Clinton, 40% favored Hillary Clinton, followed by Bernie Sanders. Now, I, I am in San Francisco, or the Bay Area, and everyone is shocked, completely shocked by this data, right? Because that's not what you or anyone you know uh, looks like. But it is, when you look at the national landscape, actually where Muslims land. Now, if you do look at young Muslims, uh, they, they do favor Bernie Sanders over Hillary Clinton by quite a large margin, but overall, this is what it looks like. And it is interesting to know that the only woman candidate has her greatest popularity among Muslims, right? So that's an interesting response to people who think that Muslims are uncomfortable with female leadership. 
The other thing to note is that Bernie Sanders, a Jew, is as popular among Muslims as he is among Jews. Now, this is, uh, you know, in terms of political affiliation, Muslims are, they lean Democrat. Uh, Muslims look a lot like Jewish Americans actually politically, and as you'll see later, look a lot more like Protestants religiously. So only 6% of Muslims identify as Republicans, but you'll also notice that Muslims are the most likely faith community to identify as independents. And what this means is that essentially Muslims are voting a lot of times on policies, not based on partisanship. Uh, and they are a community that if, if the Republican Party weren't so um, you know, negative toward the community, could actually win a lot of people over because independents um, really can go either way. And many Muslim independents also identify ideologically as conservatives and would maybe actually identify as Republicans had the rhetoric not turned so negative. Now, what are the priorities of this community? So this question gets asked um, all the time by pollsters. In fact, it's one of the oldest questions that's been asked by, by polling companies in America. And it basically asks, what are, the what are the priorities that the government should have? What should the government focus on? When you ask Muslims this question, what should the next president be focused on, the first thing, the most, uh, the most mentioned thing is the economy and jobs. So Muslims are focused on their everyday needs, their economic needs, and economic security is an issue among Muslims. The second most mentioned thing, and it is a distant second actually, it's, it's bigotry and civil rights, not surprisingly. Now, what you'll notice here is how similar Muslims are to the broader African-American community. This isn't African-American Muslims, this is African-Americans generally. Their political priorities of the Muslim community as a whole and the African-American community as a whole is almost identical. With, with uh, econ economy and jobs as number one, with um, civil liberties coming up close behind and um, education as number three. The top three priorities are actually identical. It's just that Muslims also include immigration, African Americans don't have that, but that's actually the, the, really the only difference. Interesting uh, difference between Muslims and, and the other faith communities we polled is that Muslims do not have national security as a top priority. Now a lot of people will look at that and say, uh-oh, Muslims are soft on terrorism. But a couple things is Muslims look a lot like Democrats, and also look a lot like African Americans. All three groups are not, do not mention national security as one of their top priorities. What you're really looking at here is a map of people's fears. Anytime you ask this, and it changes with time, it's not always like this, it's a map of what people are thinking about, what they're afraid of. For Muslims, for African Americans, for many Democrats, they're focused on their economic security and they're focused on their kids' education, they're focused on bigotry and civil rights. That is their everyday worry. It is not actually that they're going to be the victim of a terrorist attack because rationally that is almost not even within the realm of possibilities. You are more likely to die of furniture falling on you, literally, than, than a terrorist attack. So this is actually a more rational um, reflection of what people should be afraid of. And, and yet, on the other side with, with the other faith communities, National security is a huge issue, and that is a reflection of people's fears, uh, not a reflection of people's priorities around whether or not they want the country to be safe. This thing is so sensitive. <laughs> okay, so this helps explain where, uh, why bigotry and, and uh, civil rights is a concern for Muslims. Muslims are the most likely faith community to report having experienced some level of religious discrimination in the last year, uh, far exceeding even Jewish Americans, who tend to be the ones that the FBI will tell you are the most likely to experience a hate crime. Now, that may be because our community seldom um, reports them, but when you actually ask people, have they experienced discrimination, Muslims far, far exceed any other community in that regard. 
Now, who is experiencing the most discrimination within our community? The most likely groups within our community to experience, to say they experience discrimination, are women, young people, and Muslims without a college education. <coughs> so when you think about this, this is the most vulnerable among us, are the most likely to say that they experience some level of discrimination. <coughs> now, what does discrimination do? This is a question we had as researchers. How does it impact someone's other views? How does it impact their, their identity, their religiosity, etc.? And we found that actually it makes almost no difference except on two things. People who have experienced regular discrimination are less likely to be optimistic about the country's direction. That's not surprising. But surprising to us is that people who, who experience, Muslims who experience regular discrimination are more likely to actually be engaged in their community. So it, it is linked with less optimism, but more activism. Now what about Muslims in general and how they compare to other people uh, in terms of satisfaction with uh, the way things are going in this country? Believe it or not, Muslims are the most optimistic faith community in America. They are the most likely to think, to say that they, they think that the way things are going in this country is, is positive. And they are by far the most likely to approve of President Obama. And the two are linked. This question is likely a response to how Obama, how the Obama administration is running the country. And Muslims tend to approve of the president's performance. This is not simply that Muslims are always happy with the government. Um, under President Bush, for example, his approval rating among Muslims was 7%, compared to here, 78% for Obama. Now, the heart of the issue, political engagement. Now, does, does this, this optimism and this approval of the president um, translate into <coughs> political engagement? Yes and no. Muslims, the good news first, which is that Muslims are as likely as Jews to say, to report volunteering in their community, to report cooperating with other people to solve a problem in their neighborhood. So civic engagement or volunteerism is on par with other people. But, unfortunately, the bad news is that Muslims are far less likely to be registered to vote. They're contributing, but they are not having as much of a say. 60% of Muslims are registered to vote. These are 60% of eligible voters. So we, didn't, we actually asked people if they were citizens, and then only asked the citizens this question. 60% of eligible voters are registered to vote. However, 85% plan to vote, okay? So there's a problem here, right? We have 25% who want to vote, but haven't gotten around to it. And we call this 25% our inshallah voters. These, really, this group, the 25% who want to vote, but haven't gotten around to registering, are where I believe we have to put 100% of our energy because they're, they're easy, they're an easy you know, nudge and, and we'll get them there. Um, we should have, uh, we should have re voter registration drives, I think every single Friday until the election to get that 25% completely registered. The 15% the that don't want to vote, they're a completely different category. A lot of times we focus on them. They're actually not who we need to focus on now. They're a long-term um, focus, but they cannot be where we waste our time now because there's so many that actually want to vote but just need a nudge. So why do people want to vote? Well, we asked that question and they said things like civic duty, uh, I want to make a difference, I, I want to make sure that a certain candidate is not elected, and it's, it's an important right that they cherish. Why don't people want to vote? The people who don't want to vote, what did they say? They said they don't think it counts or matters. They don't like anyone running. A lot of people say that. And the issues they care about are not represented by anyone running. Now, what you don't find here, and we always look at what we expect to find and don't find. What I expected to find is it's hard to vote. That's why I don't want to vote. I'm not going to vote because it's against my religion to vote. Nobody said that. Literally nobody said that. Now, I'm not saying that this doesn't exist, but it is a lot, lot less prevalent than it used to be, and, and more than we thought. So the issue is not, let's convince people it's halal to vote. It's not really the issue at all. 
what is what the actually is, if you want to get people to vote that are not wanting to vote, it's, it's you convince them it counts. You convince them it makes a difference, and you convince them that you know even if the uh, the candidates aren't perfect, that getting out there and, and making their voice heard is important. One thing that actually correlates with more civic engagement, which I think is really important when you're here at a mosque, is frequent mosque attendance. So people who go to a mosque once a week or more are more likely to volunteer, to be civically engaged, to be registered to vote, and also to plan to vote. So mosques in America are a, a, a force for moderation. They're a force for a greater commitment to the system that, that a group like ISIS would want to destroy. It, it's, a direct, uh, it's a direct contradiction to what has been said about mosques in this election season. Okay, so how many people go to mosques? I hear this number thrown around all over the place. Only 2% of Muslims go to mosques. Or only 10% you know, of Muslims go to mosques. It's just not true, okay? 42% of Muslims say they go to a mosque once a week or more. It's on par with Protestants. Muslims and Protestants look identical in terms of their religious patterns. I will also mention one very important point, which is when you look at that 42% that go to a mosque frequently, and you break it down by gender, men and women, they are almost the same, virtually identical. And so if that is the case, if men and women are attending mosques at the same rate, Shouldn't our resources, space allocation, and programming reflect that reality? All right, the other exciting uh, slide. Should your religion be a part of American law? Okay, the, the question on Sharia and, and the accusations around Sharia. Well, here's, here's actually what the data says. So again, we didn't just ask this of Muslims, we asked this across the board of Jews, Catholics, Protestants, and Muslims. And the group most likely to say that they think their religion should be American law are Protestants, followed by Muslims. The majority of Muslims say they don't think this, uh, their religion should be a part of American law, but there is a, a minority, less than Protestants, but still there, that thinks it should be a part of American law. Lots of ways to interpret this. But it's important to compare it to Protestants, a very large percentage of our population. They tend to be the ones that engage policy from a religious framework. And, and nobody freaks out about it. It's normal, right? You can say, I you know it's my religious conviction that certain things are, are wrong, and therefore they're pushing for them to be illegal. Um, Muslims actually don't do that. It's, it's not their, uh, you know, we don't have the banner of sort of these kinds of things. But when you ask most Muslims who are politically active and they're working in social justice spaces, they are coming at it from a, you know, a point of religious conviction. When you look at Muslim um, priorities, political priorities, there, there were some people in other religious communities that said, you know, morality. Muslims actually never mentioned that. They're talking about jobs, they're talking about education, they're talking about civil liberties. All of these things are from the perspective of many you know, Muslims. They're working on these things from a vantage point of Islam, of, of an Islamic, um, you know, sort of liberation theology. So I think this is important data as a starting point for the conversation, rather than denying the idea that Muslims would want to see their ethical framework reflected in their country's laws. We just need to put it in the proper context with the rest of the country. Okay, now the other, fa uh, you know, uh, one of the most common um, refrains during this, this election cycle, and it's kind of been happening forever, is this idea that being a Muslim and being an American are contradictions, that you have to choose. You know, so Ben Carson said something like, you know, a Muslim has to, um, to denounce their faith in order to be president of the United States. So we wanted to test this idea is a, an, a Muslim identity and an American identity compatible or not? So we ask everyone to tell us how strong they identify with their faith and how strong they identify with the United States as their country. 
And this was the, the results. Most people identify strongly with both their faith and their, their country. And Muslims are no different in terms of um, you know, comparing to other faith communities. But what was really interesting is we looked at these two variables and how they relate to each other. Meaning, is a strong religious identity, is that linked to a weak American identity? Or the other way around? And the answer is actually somewhat surprising. What we found is that Muslims with a strong religious identity were actually far more likely to have a strong American identity than Muslims with a weak religious identity. That they are not only not contradictions, but they're actually mutually reinforcing. And then uh, the final topic that we are going to focus on is views of violence. Okay? This is very important, incredibly important data in light of this last horrific attack that we are just finding out about um, yesterday and today. So we asked this question of every American uh, or of every big community that we polled. We asked this. Some people think that for the military, now notice the wording of both, the military to target and kill civilians is sometimes justified, while others think that this kind of violence is never justified. What is your opinion? And then you could say, never, sometimes, depends, don't know, refused. Okay. Muslims are the only community that have a majority, 65%, who say it is never justified to target and kill civilians by the military. Everyone else, it's just, it's actually a minority, all right? Then we ask the same question. The only difference is instead of military, we said an individual or a small group. So the first question asked about a war crime. This is actually the definition of war crime, targeting civilians by military. The second is basically terrorism as it's generally defined. What you find is that Muslims are as likely as anyone else to denounce, quote, terrorism, and more likely to denounce war crimes. Why is this important? The reason it's important is because there is, um, there is a lot of conversation right now, again, about the propensity for Muslims to sympathize with um, violence because of this horrific attack that we just saw. And this kind of research, in addition to, to other similar research, is, is a way to respond to fear with facts. So just to summarize, Muslims lean democratic, they are engaged in their community, but less politically. They are pious and patriotic at the same time. Muslims reject attacks on civilians at least as much as anyone else. And mosque attendance is linked to civic engagement, not radicalization. And finally, Muslims are weary of discrimination, but they're still optimistic. Um, and you can read all about it uh, on our website at um, ispu.org forward slash poll. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dahlia. Our next speaker is going to be Zahra Balu. She is a civil rights attorney and the executive director of the San Francisco Bay Area chapter of the Council on American Islamic Relations, also known as CARE. Um, she's frequently seen at mosques and universities, facilitating trainings and workshops as part of CARE's grassroots efforts to empower the American Muslim community and build bridges with allies on civil rights issues. She also provides direct legal services for victims of law enforcement uh, targeting and Islamophobia. She's the recipient uh, in 2014 of the National Lawyers Guild San Francisco Bay Area Chapter's Unsung Hero Award and a 2013 recipient of the South Asian Bar Association of Northern California's Trailblazer Award. Zahra? Assalamu alaikum. So I thought about asking for a show of hands to see how many people here are registered to vote, but I don't want to embarrass the people that aren't, the inshallah voters, and so I won't ask. But if you aren't, you can register today online without printing or postage. It's something that really takes just a couple of minutes to do. Instead, I'll tell you a story. A couple of years ago, once again, the apartheid state of Israel was bombing Palestine. 
And every time this happens, we feel like it's worse than the last time. But I remember at our office, we were moved to action. And we don't engage in a lot of Palestine work, except where there's a civic engagement opportunity, where we can say to our fellow American Muslims, this is how we're going to have an impact. Because so often what we'll hear from people, whether it's the attack in France, the situation in Turkey, the ongoing... In my time at CARE, I've come across many instances like this. People who want to talk to city council about foreign policy, people who want to talk to state legislators about federal issues, right? Like this confusion of who sets zoning restrictions in place. Just a couple of days ago, many of you were following the news of what's happening with the State Board of Education and the edits to textbooks and really the Islamophobic edits to textbooks. What's frightening is that two years ago, the legislation was passed in California that opened the path to that effort. And most Muslim community members were absent from that discussion. We didn't oppose that legislation. And even in looking at the organizing that happened to oppose the edits, it was a valiant effort, and they've made a lot of success. There's been progress, they've had victories, they've gotten some of the edits fixed. But people are surprised that this is happening, right? And so if we're not paying attention, if we're not registering to vote, if our elected officials don't know who we are, this kind of thing continues to happen. Something that I'll say frequently is that I know even for me as an anti-Islamophobia activist, I think of Islamophobia as something that happens in Tennessee and Florida and Arkansas, somewhere not here. But those textbook edits that are being considered in Sacramento would open the pathway to some really horrible curriculum in our state. So what to do? Dahlia talked about the inshallah voters and about the importance of registering to vote. I wanted to review some basics as well as some possible action items. The first is, I mentioned, if you're here and you're not registered to vote, get registered to vote. If you are over the age of 18, if you will turn 18 in time for the election, if you have recently become a US citizen, and or if you have moved since the last election, register to vote. If you need to change your party, register to vote. If you haven't been getting election mail, register to vote. If it's been a few years since you voted, I tell people be safe and register to vote, right? Like you don't wanna show up on election day and find out that you couldn't register to vote. The second thing, is to tell other people to vote. Some of my early activism, before even working in the Muslim community, was in moving young people to vote, moving college students to vote, 17 year olds who were turning 18, 19 year olds who felt disenfranchised with the system already, to move them to vote. And one of the things that we learned there that applies to minority communities also, is that my friends telling me to register to vote is far more impactful than Zahra or Dahlia or Maha telling people to register to vote. Because at best, we're public speakers, we're trainers, we're randoms that you see once in a while. But when I call my parents and tell them I register to vote, they're going to listen. When I sit with my brother at dinner and I say, no, fill out the form on your phone right now while we wait for dessert to come out, he's going to get registered to vote. And so it's not enough that you're registered. Tell other people. Make it a social thing. Don't pressure them. Don't shame them. I'm actually not in the camp that believes that we should shame people who choose not to register to vote if that is their chosen method of civic engagement, if they are protesting in that way, if they are taking that energy and putting it into action elsewhere. But that's not what I find when I talk to people who aren't registered. If they're not registered, it's because they don't care, they're over the system, they don't feel like they can have an impact. And that's different. Those are the people that we want to talk to. But it can't just be election year conversation also. So yes, we're having this panel today. We're going to like register voters at dozens of massages for the next couple of months. But if our advocacy ends the day after elections, what was it all for? We've actually heard from elected officials that the Muslim community can sometimes be one of the easiest to appeal to because they can move us to vote, they can take our money, and we don't show up the day afterwards to hold them accountable. We've actually had elected officials say, we voted for XYZ legislation because we didn't hear from any Muslims. So we assumed there was no opposition, which is a really frightening concept, right? Is that even when we do show up, if it ends on election day, what was the point? This has been a concern, not just for our community, but for others. Candidates make promises, but if no one says, well, are you gonna deliver on that promise? If no one follows up and says, you didn't close Guantanamo, you didn't lower college tuition, you didn't do all of these things you promised, then I gave away my vote. And so when you're thinking about civic engagement, when you're recruiting other people to get involved, 
Don't just think between now and November. I'm really interested in what happens in January. For those that were supporting a really activist candidate a couple of months ago, what was really inspiring for me was to see that there was a commitment. That not only are we going to support these candidates, we're going to support them after they're elected. And if they don't do what, they're, what they promise, we're going to protest them. Just because I voted for you today doesn't mean I can't hold you accountable. It's not just about voting, also. So if all I'm giving is my vote, I would say that that's the least I can do. That is the absolute least. It is the bare minimum. I just had a conversation with some students who are not yet 18 and they said, what can I do? Volunteering with a campaign as visible Muslims is so important. Because one, you're building a relationship with a candidate and start very local. Everyone that eventually runs for Senate served in a local office prior. So yes, it might be really difficult to drive to Sacramento every day and volunteer in a campaign out there. It might be difficult to go to the State Board of Education meeting in person or Muslim Day at the Capitol or things like that. I'm not saying you shouldn't, you absolutely should. And I'm so proud of the Muslims who did drive out to Sacramento yesterday and spent two hours each way and a whole work day in Sacramento saying we want to be heard. But volunteering with a local campaign is how you develop a relationship. When you think about people who are friends with high-ranking elected officials, those aren't relationships that were built after I won the seat for Congress or after I was sworn in as a senator. I knew you when I ran for school board, right? Like you put in countless hours when I ran for school board. You door knocked for me in your local neighborhood. You wrote me a check on a regular basis and you stayed in touch. And so actually getting involved with a campaign is so important. They remember that. I would. I remember the volunteers that help us put together our dinners. I remember the volunteers that will put in the extra hours, right? That's true for a nonprofit organization. That's going to be true also for candidates. And those are people that are moving up. So if you have their ear now, you maintain it and you keep it. That's true also, I mentioned the high school students. So I will get questions from people who are not citizens. Um, and who are under the age of 18. How, how can I make a difference? What can I do? You can register other people to vote. You can mobilize them to vote. You can volunteer on a campaign. You don't have to be a citizen or even of voting age to volunteer on a campaign, right? If you can't give money to a campaign directly, either because you can't afford it or because you're not a US citizen, you can encourage others to give money to a campaign. I've given up on chasing the unicorn of a unified Muslim vote. We're not all going to agree on a candidate, which is why the results of which candidates we're supporting are so astounding, because I can't believe it. But I get that like, we're in the liberal Bay Area. We're not going to agree. We can't agree on when we start Ramadan. We can't agree on when we celebrate either how many Rakat of prayer for Zarawi. We're not going to agree on who the next US president should be. But what we can agree on is that if I show up as a visible Muslim, as someone who either looks Muslim or acts Muslim, right? I want to be careful about using the term visible Muslim. If I show up as someone who identifies as Muslim in whatever way that means for me, and I'm involved in the civic process, and we've got a few people on each local campaign, including the ones that are running against each other, that's a good thing. That is a very good thing, because they will remember that. Let them fight over our votes. Some of you may be following the District 17 race in, in the South Bay, where two candidates are competing for the Muslim vote. They're reaching out to Muslim leaders, they're trying to visit as many mosques as possible. I don't think we're going to agree on which one works. And I think it's great that there's Muslims on both campaigns. I will stop there. I'm most excited about the Q&A part of this discussion. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sahara. Um, our third panelist is Maha al -Ghanedi. She is the Chief Executive Officer of the Islamic Networks Group, um, the author of training handbooks on outreach for American Muslims, as well as training seminars for public institutions on developing cultural competency with the American Muslim community. She's a senior fellow of the American Leadership Forum and was recently named by the San Jose Business Journal as one of Silicon Valley's Women of Influence. Thank you, Maha. I'm going to go ahead and get right into it because um, we only have about um, eight minutes. Um, so we're going to sort of take a, a, a left turn here because we're not going to I'm not going to talk about political engagement in the same way that Dania and Zahra uh, just uh, just spoke about. I'm going to talk about a different kind of political engagement, and that is civic engagement, particularly engagement in our school system. Um, 
the organization, for those of you that may not be familiar with it, which doesn't surprise me at all, because most of our work is actually not within the Muslim community, it's outside. We work primarily with schools, with law enforcement agencies, with healthcare facilities, with corporations. Our presenters are from the Muslim community, but you don't really see us, we don't really publicize because of the sensitive nature of the work that we do, so I wouldn't be surprised at all, uh, sisters and brothers, if you didn't know <laughs> about this organization. We've been around for 23 years, we have affiliates in 22 states, and our mission is what you see there, encounter prejudice and discrimination. I always use the iceberg as a way to describe the work that we do because I think it's important for you to understand what we do. We're strictly education and interfaith engagement. And I use the iceberg above the waterline is the behavior that would be work like political activism, civil rights um, advocacy, and so forth. Underneath that waterline are all of those things that impact a person's behavior. ING's work is in that space where we try to impact beliefs that people have, in this case about Islam and Muslims, which has a direct impact on a person's attitude, which then has an impact on a person's behavior. So we are in the space of work in, of prevention, preventing bullying, preventing bias, preventing stereotyping, preventing discrimination, and addressing those issues um, as, um, as they come up. Um, Islamophobia, hopefully all of you know what that is. It is more than just uh, these, um, these frames. Uh, it is an industry that is producing uh, vitriolic material about Islam and Muslims. It is no coincidence that people have the negative perceptions that they do. It didn't happen by itself. Um, it is very old, it's very historical, but more recently, I would say since 9-11, it's really kicked in, $200 million has been spent on this industry, um, given to certain individuals that have been producing very negative material about Islam and Muslims, and these are the kinds of frames uh, that, they, uh, that they project. Now, how does this impact schools? It impacts the way that Islam is taught in, um, in schools. Teachers themselves, of course, may be biased, um, which also impacts the interaction, their interaction with the students. The teaching material itself may be inaccurate, and there are many examples of that throughout the country. Um, and uh, these are examples of two books, for example, that are used in some school districts that we've, um, that we've worked against, and uh, most school districts now um, have stopped using them as a result. Discussions about current events may be very insensitive towards Muslim students, where Muslim students are usually singled out um, as the experts, as the spokespeople for, um, for Islam. And, um, and terms such as us and them usually relegates Muslim students as uh, the enemy. Also, harassment of Muslim students results from this. And polls have, um, or surveys rather, have been done. Um, one that was done recently by CARE last year, which found that about 55% of kids experience verbal bullying um, and harassment in schools. Other surveys have shown that it's actually all the way up to 80% in some uh, in some cases. Um, and what kind of uh, things do kids experience? They experience things like name calling and teasing, being called terrorist, camel jockey, killer, harassment of Muslim uh, girls. Uh, not surprising, um, as Dania pointed out, in the people that are usually the first victims of discrimination are women that stand out um, as, as Muslims. Uh, and parents are usually unaware of these, um, of these issues. I can tell you from personal experience, growing up in the United States, I was um, harassed. And I never went home and talked about it because it was, uh, it was, I was ashamed of it. So I didn't talk about it. I didn't talk about it with my parents. I didn't talk about it with really anyone. And I just sort of learned how to, how to cope with it. So this is quite common. Uh, and it's important to put in context that bullying is a national problem. One out of four kids is a victim of bullying with our community and with the Sikh community as well, and with the gay community, it tends to be much higher rates, and why this is important. Now, what we are interested in, kids are bullied for all sorts of reasons, what we're interested in is bullying that is based, that is ethnically or religiously motivated. Ethnically, because they're South Asian, because they're Arab, because they're perceived to be uh, of, of, uh, of, of a Muslim background, and religiously motivated, because that type of bullying, we believe, is preventable 
through education, youth empowerment, and parental engagement. Education in schools, youth empowerment, and parental engagement. I'm going to talk about these three really quickly, and I hopefully I have a little bit more time for educators. Um, and many of you know, and many of you might be actually speakers or were speakers at one time for ING. We are actually in schools every day. How many presentations and seminars does ING do? About 500 in the Bay Area alone. When you add up all of the presentations and seminars that we do across the country, it's around 2,000. We do an average of three a day. Three a day. We're out of your children's schools supplementing education about Islam and Muslims, and we have various topics uh, that we do that with. And all of our content is scholarly based. If you want to become a speaker for us, we would love to have you. All of our speakers are volunteers. The reason we're able to do some work, uh, so much work is because all of our speakers are volunteers. They're trained and they're certified to do this work. We also do quite a bit of work with educators as well. Uh, and it's about a two and four hour uh, workshop that we do. And we do the same work in, in interfaith uh, panels. The impact is tremendous. For those of you that do educational outreach, that are out there speaking to churches and synagogues and schools and so forth, you know that the impact is there, right? People do change their perceptions when they learn more about Islam and when they engage with you as a Muslim. And that's why this work is so important. We just need to do a lot of it across the country, and we have a window of, of time, I feel, uh, in which to do this in before it, uh, you know, before before it gets uh, worse. We also do. Uh, we also have online curriculum. Not every teacher is going to call us in. They're not going to invite us in. So we've put all of our curriculum online. It's free for teachers. They can download our powerpoints. They can download our uh, scripts. Um, videos, all sorts of material that we provide for teachers to be able to teach the stuff without ever having a Muslim speaker in the classroom. And we also have a lot of answers to frequently asked questions about Islam. What we're really excited about is the new program for youth where we actually now, I'm going to quickly, we didn't talk about student rights or parental rights, maybe we can talk about that later. Um, and, you know, Zahra is here to sort of respond to these questions. Um, what I do want to talk about is our youth program Okay, my eight minutes are off. Oh, I timed myself. So, um, we actually certify uh, Muslim youth speakers so that they're able to respond to questions about Islam in schools, so that they're able to present Islam, because it's required to be taught in middle and high school, and it comes up in all of the grades, so that they're able to present. And our presentations for kids are about 10 to 20 minutes, um, and then we also provide them, we also uh, develop their skills in responding to difficult questions about Islam and Muslims. So I'm very excited about that. We've partnered with MENA and we'll be doing a lot more of that work. We, we did our pilot right here at the MCC and I see some of the kids here <laughs> that attended that training and I'm hoping that they'll be the first ones to be certified um, as speakers. What that means is this, when I get a call in um, at, the, at the ING office, instead of sending an adult person like me, a Pitla, who sort of is a, is, is a parent to these kids, what we want to do is we want to refer them to the kids in that school or in that school district that can actually go out and do this. Peer-to-peer -peer presentations are far more effective than adult presentations. How do you prevent bullying? How do you prevent harassment? How do you prevent te uh, teasing? It is when their friends speak up, not when their teachers do it, not when the principal, not when the parent becomes involved. It stops when their friends say, you know what, cut it out, cut it out. I don't like you doing what, you, you know, what you're doing. And that's, and it's, it's powerful. Peer-to-peer -peer, uh, uh, relationships are incredibly important, which is why we want to certify kids across the country. I'm gonna stop here in, because I ran out of my time and I can take questions later. Thank you. Well, we have a lot of collective wisdom on this panel, so we want to give you a chance to ask some questions. Um, we are going to be passing out note cards. I believe there's someone coming around passing out some note cards and pens. Um, so if you could write your questions on the note card, they will bring them up to me, and we will uh, take a selection of questions. So I'm just going to give you just a minute to, um, to do that. Do you want to play the video? 
Um, yeah, maybe while we're waiting, um, while the note cards are being passed out, we are going to share with you just a short video. In Zahra's impassioned speech about voting was not enough to get you to register, this video will push you over the edge and get you, get you interested. So we'll just share this with you. This is an ISPU video that we just, um, that we just put out.
All right, so how will, how will this influence uh, policymakers? We are taking this research directly to policymakers. We had, um, I was, I participated in a meeting with, with uh, senior officials at the White House and this research was presented. We held a briefing on Capitol Hill where we, where we shared it with um, staffers and, and, and members of Congress. Um, we've written about this data in, in op-eds. We've had multiple uh, media uh, articles and, and appeared on uh, news uh, programs citing this data. But also, ultimately, there's a limit to what we can do. We really, this has to be disseminated by all of you in how you engage with, with your elected officials. This is all public. You can download the PowerPoint. You can take these graphs and share them on your Facebook page and your Twitter account. So I want you to own this data yourself and write about it. Engage when you talk to your uh, elected official. Tell them about this research. That's really the only way that it will, it will impact policy. So how can a 14-year-old boy be involved in, um, in in the program? So is Hak, if you could stand up, is Hak Matan, he's this young man right here. We just hired him. He's our very first ING youth coordinator. Great background. Um, he used to be the head of the NSA at his, um, at, at his uh, university. Uh, we have uh, six to eight hour workshops depending on what kind of training that you want. By the end of that training, you will develop skill sets to be able to, to respond to difficult questions and to be able to present as well. Then we certify you through testing. You do have to pass a test and then you're part of a network that uh, would include lots of uh, training and you become part of a national network of youth speakers. We just started the program, as I said, and we're partnering with Bennett as our first big partner to do this work, but uh, MCC was our first pilot, which I'm really excited about, thanks to Brother Munir and, and others that helped organize this. And I think we trained about 50 or 60, but I think only uh, 15 are, are, are becoming uh, certified, and I hope some of the young guys that I've seen here and young ladies are gonna come to the test that's happening in uh, the end of July. The question about the effectiveness of voting is hard because there's no soundbite answer to it. And also the person that feels that way could feel that way for countless reasons. Which is why I think the, the inshallah voter video strategy is so important. This idea that if I'm talking to my friends on a long-term basis about the effectiveness and importance of civic engagement, I as a peer am going to be able to push them over, to, to move them on the issue. The few ideas that come to mind for me are one, that local elections, like hyper-local elections, school board elections, are sometimes won by just dozens of votes. Our Sacramento Executive Director, Bass in all capacity, ran for the school board last year, maybe two years ago, lost by about 100 votes. Ran again this year and won by about 100 votes. I'm more concerned about having diversity on the school board because those are the people that are directly overseeing the policies, the issues, the practices, the remedies when my child has an issue in the community. Those are also people, again, that are just starting out in the process. People that run for Congress today ran for school board 10 or 20 years ago. Less than 100 votes. That's as many people are as are in this room today. That's one issue. The second issue is that we are winning in certain cases. The Muslim community has been able to push out bad elected officials and bring in good ones. So it's not just about getting people in, sometimes it's about getting people out. The third is that as Muslims, we believe we're rewarded for our efforts. So I may not always win, but I made the intention, I did everything I could. And so when I think about my civic engagement being divinely driven or being motivated by my faith, I may not get the president that I want, but did I do everything I could to get the best person in office? Now, longer conversation offline about lesser evils and, and how we determine what the best person is for our individual vote, but did I make every effort? And then the last piece is, that person that thinks that their one vote doesn't count, if that's all they're doing, yeah, they're taking the least effective civic engagement strategy, right? So yes, start with the voting, but if I'm not staying in touch with the elected official, if I'm not giving money, if I'm not writing to them, 
on a regular basis and I'm not volunteering in my community, then yeah, like I, I'm gonna, going to have little impact. I'm going to get as much out of it as I put in. Um, okay, thank you so much. These are all really great questions, all the ones that are coming in. Um, so I'm going to throw out a couple more. Um, there are a number of questions that similarly ask uh, the, the same question, which is, um, I think a lot of people are feeling helpless or, or they're not really sure what to do on two fronts. One, how do you start to denounce and counter the views of groups like ISIS? Um, but two, how do you denounce and counter the, the anti-Muslim rhetoric that's also coming from, uh, from politicians and others at the moment? Um, as, a, as a normal citizen, how do you do that? Or as a working woman or, or um, just in your daily life? So that's one question. Uh, second question, how do you talk to your kids about Islamophobia? Um, and a third question, um, let's see, um, there's a couple of spe very specific uh, questions about the poll, um, so I'm going to ask one of them, which is, can you explain why there's a disconnect between mosque rhetoric, which often focuses on foreign policy, and your findings which show that foreign policy is actually less of a concern for American Muslims? <laughs> I'll start. Um, so let me start actually with how to talk to your kids about Islamophobia. Because it's a question I've, I've gotten, personally I've gotten, almost everywhere I've gone. Where, wherever I go. This is a question that has come up. And so I... I would say there are three things we need to do. This tricky little mic. Okay. So here are the three things I recommend. One is we have to teach our Muslim American kids about their own history in this country. The idea that they are foreigners is a fallacy. It's a fallacy. It's a historical fallacy. That Islam is a foreign concept, foreign agent in America is not, it's just not true. If we were to, to make them aware and make them proud through wonderful curriculum like, like Maha just talked about, about Islam's history in this country, that would, that would give them the, the confidence to, to respond to some of these issues. Number two is this idea of helping our children grow spiritually so that they are able to, and this is something we all need, not just our kids, I personally need it, but this idea of wearing a, a barrier or wearing a, an armor of praise or an armor of love, not love for, for the bigots necessarily, that's not, I'm, I'm incapable of that, but love for those things that they degrade. We, if, the idea that Islamophobia is just something that we have to um, kind of, you know, defend against so we're not victims of like bullying is not true. Bullying is one aspect of it. A much more pervasive issue is internalizing Islamophobia, is believing Islamophobia, is, is actually thinking, yeah, maybe something, you know, is wrong with our faith. And so that response, the ability, these responses that kids are able to give it's first to themselves, is to be able to actually reinforce why this identity, why this faith is worth maintaining. And if we don't all continuously replace that, that sense of awe and, and, and deep love for the Prophet and, and Allah, it is very, very easy for it to get chipped away by the attacks. Okay? And then the third is to arm our children and ourselves with the critical thinking skills necessary to dismantle and deconstruct the attacks. Because they're actually all built on false logic. They really are. But if we don't have these skills, if we don't have these conversations um, to, to really look at things from the lens of critical thinking, it's very easy to get pulled into them. So I, I, those would be broadly the three things I would I would recommend is teach the history, um, you know, continuously 
strengthen our praise and our love for our faith. And then third is critical thinking. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> then you reminded me that part of our training that we do with youth is a deconstruction of questions that are asked to help them understand that some of these questions that come at us are usually loaded with a lot of as assumptions and, and misperceptions and that we need to first unpack that. Don't jump in and respond a lot of the questions that come at us, but to unpack it and to ask, why do you think this way? You know, why, what makes you think that all Muslims are this, or that women are, you know, mistreated and so forth. To try to get to the root of the question that is being asked and respond to that is, instead of instead of jumping in immediately. Um, and, and because when you do that, you're actually reinforcing, and that does require uh, critical thinking, so I'm really glad that you mentioned this. I'm also gonna say one thing about, to add to what Dania, uh, Dania's advice was, which was brilliant, is to speak up. It's incredibly important that when you hear something that is negative, that is critical of, you, of your religion, not only against yourself, but other people, you absolutely need to speak up, absolutely. I leave every presentation that I do with Americans of other faith by asking, asking them to become ambassadors. Now that you've learned more, now that you understand the truth about this faith and so forth, you now need to speak up. You now need to challenge uh, what people uh, say to you that it that is negative. Now that you know, you have that responsibility. Um, and I would say the same thing to Muslims. You need to speak up for your for, for yourself and for your uh, for your religion. It requires literacy, which is uh, to the point of Vedia. You have to know your religion well. Um, there are a number of organizations that provide answers to frequently asked questions. ING is one of them. They're all online. Questions on Sharia, questions on ISIS, questions on general questions uh, you know, about Islam, on women, and, and all sorts of common questions that we usually get. Very easy to respond to, but you have to make the effort to read <laughs> and to, to, to reflect and to put it in your own language. Um, to be able to respond, that's, I mean, we have to do this. We have no other, it, it's not an option for us not to do this. Do it, if you don't want to do it for yourself, do it for your children. Do it for the next generation. You, but you have to do it. 